to get a recap and see the videos of every panel. Um, it's just been an incredible week. So thank you all for coming and supporting and please share and tweet and join the conversation. Um, speaking about joining the conversation, Courtney over here is live tweeting. That's so official. <laughs> yes. yes. So official. <laughs> so join in on the conversation by following at Mr. Samuel French and hashtag Musicals Week. And thank you to those that are in the audience who are already tweeting. I don't know who you are, but see if you're going to see. We are live streaming right now. So hello, everybody who's tuning in. Um, a couple people had to, because of the rain, they're tuning in instead. So hey, guys. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, please hold your questions towards the end. We have a Q&A. And right after this, we're so excited, it's the first Samuel French produced concert at 54 Below. It's right after this at 9.30. And we have a discount code for you. It's French35. It's not too late to buy your tickets. Buy them now. It's an amazing lineup. We have, it's hosted by Amanda Green, Charles Strauss will be there, Jay Armstrong Johnson, Emily Skeggs is performing. I, I, had, I went to the sound check today and it is absolutely incredible. I was getting really teary and I was really excited. So um, the musical theater nerd was really excited. So you will not, it'll be worth every penny. I really encourage you guys to go because it's going to be great. And it's for a great cause because it's for the Dramatist Skill Fund. So here we are. Yay! I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. Got it. we got it. So okay. I'm going to pass. I'm sorry. Oh, please silence your phone. Yes, you can tweet, but please don't text and check your Facebook and email and all those things. Um, so now I'm going to pass off to our moderator for the night, Kent Nicholson, who is the director of musical theater at Playwright Horizons. We are so happy to have him. He's also a director, and um, he teaches all over. His have, he has a very extensive theater background, so please check out his bio. Uh, basically, means I'm old. <laughs> uh, just kidding, sort of. Um, so great. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Thank you for tuning in. Um, 
Just a quick introduction of our panelists. Uh, all, all the way over to my left is Brendan Boldeen, who is the, uh, if I get your title wrong, excuse me, but Director of New Works for the National Alliance for Musical Theater, which is a terrific organization that is provides services for writers uh, and producers of musical theater all around the country. Uh, Michael Friedman, uh, author of uh, Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, composer Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, Unknown Soldier, Love's Labor's Lost, many of the civilian shows, uh, and sundry others. Uh, Jackson Gay, who is a freelance director uh, and teacher, uh, at uh, worked at many places around the country, including Yale Rep, the Geffen, uh, and currently working on a project called These Paper Bullets, um, which will be making its way to the Atlantic, right? Yes. Uh, later this season, and uh, is a highly anticipated new form of musical theater. <laughs> yeah. uh, and immediately to my left is Shakina Nabak, who is the, what, what is your official title? Executive Director? Founding Artistic. Founding Artistic Director of the Musical Theater Factory, which is one of the most exciting new developments on the scene <laughs> Uh, in terms of developing new musicals uh, within the last two years now, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's doing a tremendous amount of work here in New York, and uh, I think we'll be hearing a lot more. I look forward to hearing more about what you're up to on this panel. So that's our esteemed colleagues, my mm -hmm. esteemed colleagues, who uh, are here to engage in a conversation about new forms of musical theater and what's going on uh, it, in the development trenches and how the form is changing and and what that portends for the future. Um, Michael, I'd actually really like to start with you because you are a composer and a writer who is probably m most of the people on the panel most uh, engaged in the process of creating from the start these works. And um, uh, from for me, you've, you've worked in all kinds of musical types. I mean, you from from the sort of anarchic punk rock populism of Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson to uh, the work of the civilians, where often what you're tasked with is taking these interviews and sort of as closely as possible to the original, making songs out of the spoken dialogue, um, which is a whole other way of writing. And uh, I'm wondering how content informs form when you sit down to write. If it's when it's your idea, is that different than when it's Steve Cosson, the right. artistic director of the Civilians' idea? Well, I think you always start with um, you always start with a kernel of an idea. I, I always joke that if you're writing a musical, they uh, or any form of musical theater, at some point you will come to a horrible dark night of the soul where you uh, <laughs> hate yourself and hate your collaborators and hate the work and hate the performers and hate the artistic director and are filled with loathing for the entire universe. <laughs> <laughs> at that point, you cannot go back and remember what that kernel was, what the thing you thought you were making originally was. You are going to be screwed. Uh, so in a funny way, for me, it's that. It's what is the starting impulse. Um, and usually I think the form always grows out of that impulse. Mm -hmm. on, on Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, it was that uh, Alex Timbers and I met and were discussing, and finally, uh, very early, about 45 minutes after we had met, uh, the topic of Andrew Jackson came up, um, and we both had a very different relationship through school uh, with the topic of that period. And out, we both then sort of came upon, well, he's kind of like a terrible rock star, uh, sort of. The, the influence of populism is of a kind of rock star who can't uh, sort of can't give up the spotlight and is that person. And so as soon as that form happened, as that idea happened, the form of the show in a weird way grew out of that uh, existing impulse. Um, when I was working on Love Savers Lost, obviously the challenge there was how do you turn a five, uh, the five act structure of a Shakespeare comedy into a one act structure of a musical? And what, what are you? What are you jet jettisoning? What are you adding? What are you changing? Um, and are you completely um, uh, ruining Shakespeare in the process? Mm. And with the civilians, I think it always comes with a real impulse. Um, when we went to Colorado Springs to uh, hang out in mega churches and talk to the evangelical community there over a year, a very exciting year in Colorado Springs, um, the real impulse was to just figure out what was happening in these communities that we didn't know that much about at first. And so that, that was sort of the given impulse. And in the end, I think 
the storytelling is what the, the impulse to tell the stories of what uh, of whatever that germinating idea was um, is sort of what creates the form. Mm -hmm. On some other level of lightly interjects, I was thinking about this and realizing that at some point we sort of created the first 20 minutes of the show, which we weirdly called Act One, uh, even though the show was a one act, 90 minute show. We always called the first 20 minutes Act One. And in that 20 minutes, we sort of at some point said, well, what if we squeezed all of Les Mis into 20 minutes? What would happen? <laughs> And I look at it now and I realize I had forgotten that. I was looking through old notebooks and found that I was like, oh yeah, the first 20 minutes are sort of like the entire structure of all three hours of Les Mis yeah. in 20 minutes. <laughs> and what happens if you do that? And it is sort of like, well, you do turn tragedy into comedy by, in some ways, a comedy is just a tragedy that has been compressed so that everything has to happen incredibly quick. <laughs> uh, and a lot of that story is actually tragic. I mean, yes, right? and so that is, I mean, it is. Creating uh, a sort of uh, ironic, comedy out of the tragedy that Andrew Jackson was responsible I will say one other thing about structure, which is almost, there's a reason that so many musicals one loves are based on underlying material. And I will include historical subjects, because at least we knew that Jackson would be born, would become president, would die. Those things were true. No, and, but the dates in which that would happen, the people we were going to add, he was not going to live on into the 20th century. He was not going to actually be born in the 18th century. Um, and in the case of civilian shows, we start off usually with having collected this material, which creates the world that will make the show out of. We're not starting from scratch. I find musicals that are made completely from scratch uh, amazing in the fact that they can find a structure, because it's so frightening uh, when you make something from scratch as a musical, because at some point you often do find yourself saying, well, we could cut every song. We could just we could rearrange everything. We could just start over, right. and at that point you're sort of like talk about a dark night of the soul. <laughs> so uh, that would be I think the reason so many wonderful musicals are based on underlying material, even if that underlying material is just the suggestion of a structure, is because there's so many other things you have to worry about when creating musical theater. Right. How, how much do you worry about uh, conventional musical theater writing techniques? In other words. The I want song, or the, I, or the, or do those things concern you as you write? Well, I find that when I look at shows that I love, and when I look at my own work, whether I love it or not, uh, I find that <laughs> maybe in all popular forms, um, the best things are, are shows in which people have attempted to shatter the form and tried to go off on new directions and whatever. And what's funny is sooner or later, the, the, the basic forms emerge anyway. At some point, some character in the show is going to sing about what they might desire. That's going to happen because people tend to open their mouths to desire something. <laughs> uh, and you weirdly might find that happening the first third of the show because that might be, and that's sort of like, but it is a funny thing that that might come very late after you said there will be no I want songs, there will be no, uh, certainly in Portraits of Solitude, we were very <laughs> brace and, and sort of probably really annoying at first about how we weren't going to do any of these things. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, there's a song for the main character second. There's a sort of world building song that's first. And look, the two main characters meet and sing a big duet that's fourth. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think those are all part of some. But those had happened because the story demanded those things to happen. So I, I think you want to, in a funny way, we all end up speaking in, um, uh, we all end up doing speaking in forms that are recognizable, but it's important sometimes to discover why those forms uh, exist in the first place. Right. Why well, cliches, in a funny way, a cliche is a cliche when you discover, falling in love is a cliche, but when you fall in love, it's like, it is a new experience. Right, right. It, re it reminds me a little bit, the acting uh, director and teacher, Joe Chaikin, talks about stereotypes and cliches a lot in his work, saying, only by working through the cliche and then breaking through that cliche can you find the truth in something. So that that's, sounds a little like the, the writing process for you in those moments. I hope so, I think yeah. so. Well, I'm thinking about Fortress of Solitude specifically and, and the liner notes section of that book, which is a very strange mid set, midway through the book. The whole book sort of changes tone after it, and it's literally the liner notes to an album that the main character has written, which talk about one of the other characters in the book. And thinking about how you chose to dramatize that, 
And, and how does the, the source material then inform story structure? I, th I feel like that there's an interesting choice. Made. Fortress of Solitude is this enormous, very wonderful novel by Jonathan Lethem. And um, when I first read it, Daniel Auken, the director, suggest, uh, told me to read it and said, I think there might be something here. And I read it and called him back and was like weeping. I said, this is the most moving. This novel is unbelievable. I love this novel. I love this story. We can't possibly touch this thing. And then I called about 12 hours later, having, I think, desperately read it again, and said, we have to do this. We have to do this. <laughs> and I think it was reading it, the, looking at it the second time, uh, the novel ruptures rather violently halfway through, uh, really a little more than halfway through, mm -hmm. in a way that I suddenly was like, oh, well, that's an, act, that's an act break. And then starts up again in a completely different way, which is these liner notes. Up until then, it has been a kind of, if not normal, a third person, a basic third person narrative kind of structure. And then all of a sudden you start this out, the second part of the novel, and it begins as liner notes written by the hero of the sort of main character of the first part. Uh, and what was most exciting was it's liner notes to an album of songs that Jonathan's describing, but that don't exist, which felt like the greatest gift that you could possibly <laughs> be given uh, as a songwriter is to, to read about a song and have it described and then have to figure out what would that song be. And so for me, that was sort of the first place where I got really excited about what is it to create uh, uh, music that exists in this fiction but didn't exist in history, uh, and just start. And that was sort of the that was sort and of. And did that help you sort of find a tone for the rest of the piece? It was did that in the beginning, which was the idea of everyone on Dean Street in a in a particular moment, right, in a particular day, uh, and what all of that. Uh, sonically, how you could create that sonically on the stage, almost like street scene or something like that. And those two, sort of the liner notes and Dean Street were the two things I, I had in my head as we started writing that. Right. Right. Uh, Jackson, i um, love to turn to you real quick, because I'm sort of moving from in the, to the creation of these things, moving to production and direction, which obviously that's your bailiwick. Uh, and thinking about, I also know that you're a, uh, um, a, a director of a lot of new plays as well, and wondering if you notice or, or how you feel about uh, the new play world versus new musical world, and are they sort of coming together in a weird way? Are they intersecting in different ways? How are they different? How are they the same? I guess that's the essence of the question. Uh, <clears throat> I like the, 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 the name Bailiwick, first of all, I want to say. Um, uh, I think, to me, uh, they are very similar, um, or, or they're becoming more and more similar, just the way that you approach them, um, or the way that I approach them, I should say, um, because kind of what Michael was, was talking about, how you kind of go back to, um, you find yourself going back to just basic things, you know. Um, it's the same in a new play and in a musical, in my experience, um, because you're you're trying to storytell. Um, you're trying to figure out what's going on in this, what's going on in this piece. What do people want? You know, what's at stake? Uh, what are you trying to say? And sometimes, not completely, but it, it, it's sort of irrelevant if it's um, words or a song. You know. Uh, and that's the way that I, that I look at it when I'm when I'm looking at those things. Um, but also, it's just harder and harder to to say what something is because you know I feel like so many things that I've worked on in the last couple of years, I have a hard time describing what it is. You know, mm -hmm. I it's not a musical, but it's not a play with music necessarily. It's not a, a chamber opera. You know, you just try out lots of different answers. And try to figure out and try to land on the thing that it is, um, but writers that that I work with or that I just know um, and and talk to about this stuff, they're all in some ways interested in um, music and trying to reach people more mm -hmm. with whatever they can use, you know, and also something that just distinguishes what we all do from uh, watching a movie, you know? Um, so I, I, 
Yeah, it, it's, it's, I don't even think about musicals as musicals any, anymore in a weird way. Like I do, but I, the other, and the other part of me just is, just seems sort of normal for it to be not normal, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and again, like I said, like in the last couple of years, I feel that. Mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, do you find that the writing of musicals approaches plays the idea of subtext and 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 the way the dialogue works and that they yeah. might be more headed in that direction. I really do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there of course there are some that don't, you know. Um, and there's the big, you know, spectacle. Um, look at all of the sets, you know, all that kind of thing, which also has its place. You know, I wish that. Um, it maybe wasn't all over the place, but you know. But there, there's that. But I, I find that people that are um, attempting to uh, work on those kind of pieces do tend to be very focused on um, a real form and a real care and the and the and all aspects, you know, of it. Whether they ever get it to a, a place where it's up on its feet is very hard to do, but. Um, yeah, I do. Uh, how how much does form inform your directing? So the the storytelling form, the architecture of something. So you know, as, as Michael was talking about, Fortress of Solitude. Um, how does that inform your approach to a new musical? Uh, it informs it a lot because uh, that's another way that it's very similar to working on a new play, a straight play. Um, a lot of you know new playwriters, um, like for instance, um, you know David Ajmi or Victor Lodato or something like, or some you know people like that. They write even though it's on a, a, a musical and it has no music in it. It's it's like a score, you know. It's and it's really hard, great work to do because it's so challenging because you don't have notes. You know, mm -hmm. so you, you you know actors are not required to you know seeing something that somebody writes. So and you can't you know so it's hard to um, find the music of the piece as it is in somebody's head. You mm -hmm. know, um, and also allow the actor to you know be bringing themselves and everything that they have to offer to it. Um, form. The form, it, it, you know, it, it, it causes everything to happen, you know? Because if you are not paying attention to it and you're not um, uh, embracing it, even if you think, oh, this is, I think it would be better this other way, or, you know, it, you have to embrace it. Whatever it is, you, you embrace it so that it's possible to find um, ways that, that maybe you could break from it, but you have to go for it first before you can, um, you know, try to do something else, you know what I mean? Yeah, do you find yourself leaning on, on traditional, again, we have, you know, I think it, since we're talking about new forms of musicals, I'm sort of, I'm interested in the dynamic between what we would think of as a conventional form of musical, you know, whether that's Rodgers and Hammerstein or Lerner and Lowe or, uh, Gypsy or whatever, and how those operate versus how something like Fun Home would operate, which is, feels very new and fresh to me, or Hamilton. Um, but they still share things. Do you find yourself Do you think in that case that the form is new or the content? And I mean that in well, the sense that's a good that question. The sure what's amazing is how the forms survive, and that what's interesting is how much amazing new kinds of content they can yeah, hold. Yeah, yeah. And that's where I always find, I, I'm never sure. What, what I is say a that, new yeah, what, what, what is a new form? Uh, I mean, Hamilton certainly fits into that, in my opinion, you know, is that it's, uh, is that it's a very actually sturdy storytelling technique that's being used. It's just the musical form and the vocabulary and the, and the idea of this diverse cast that's new, new, in quotes, for that, you know. Um, but Fun Home, it feels different. You okay, know, no, I, I, I think it's always it's an interesting always, question. Yeah. Of but that's why I'm interested in the, the dynamic of yeah. that and, and, and how much you find yourself leaning on what, what a director, you know, who's directing Gypsy would, like the intersection <laughs> where the songs start, you know, and 
how much of that informs your work and how much of that do you find you have to I think, leave behind and create new paths? You know what, a lot of it, just I'm sure I, I have a feeling this is, you know, an experience uh, that a lot of people have. You just know certain things because you've also done, you know them in your body, you know, um, because you, you cared enough to, you know, know about history and, and also from just experience doing something over and over again. So a lot of things you don't even know that you're leaning on, but you're, you lean on them. And also you just recognize things mm -hmm. without even ha being able or, or being required to say it out loud. And again, some things just work, you know. Um, some things work and so you, you are desperate for things that work. So you, um, you know, you at least explore that and try that. And then other things that come, come from that that maybe step, step away from that, um, that's just the, that's the fun of making theater and the fun of being in the room. But I, I feel like if you don't have uh, that you're, you're a solid ground, you know, under, mm -hmm. under you, uh, those things tend to not really actually be possible. You know, mm -hmm. you have to start someplace and then grow. Yeah. 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 And problem solve in a way. Right, yeah. and problem solve. And yeah. be open, you know. Uh -huh. Be very open and um, not actually let go of all the rules. That's what I mean. It's like you know what they are, so you don't actually have to say out loud, oh, this, this, I can't do this. But, you know, you just know it and then. You, you let go of it, and mm -hmm. things happen. Going back to Michael's comment about discovering suddenly, oh, you have, in Fortress of Solitude, you sort of did follow the rules, even despite the fact that yeah. you, the, the, the form mm -hmm. sort of, the content sort of dictates the <coughs> form a little bit. And because you are writing a musical on some level, it's going to be a musical, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise, it's something else, I guess. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, Shakina, you um, at Musical Theater Factory, you work with a tremendous amount of artists, and uh, <laughs> check out Musical Theater Factory's website. It's it's incredible how many people are moving through there. Uh, but you also intersect with them at all different points in their writing process, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are very early in their writing process. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm wondering if uh, you know how much. The writers that you see, who who also tend to be early career, if that, how much they're paying attention to traditional forms? Are they how much are they wanting to break form? Are are they concerned about it at all? Or you know how, how what what sort of the bird's eye view as you watch all these people come through your your factory? I think there are um, I think there are a few uh, groups of of artists that are gravitating toward the factory. There's the, the founding artists that were the group of people that I called up and I was, who wants to build a theater and a porn studio? Let's do it. And, the, and those folks. It's a long tradition of that, by yes. the way. Yeah, exactly. Like, Playwrights Rise is the big yeah, one. Exactly. <laughs> and, um, and, and that group, I think those folks are, are dear friends of mine who are really interested in um, exploring form and shattering convention um, and trying to make their own intervention into mm -hmm. musical theater. Uh, and then there are um, sort of a large group of other early career writers who saw what we were doing and wanted to get involved and have since gotten involved, um, who uh, I think just looking at sort of the, the broad strokes of the kind of work that's been coming through our development programs, some of them are in that boat of wanting to, uh, wanting to rock it. <laughs> and then some, uh, some folks are really interested in making the next great American musical. Um, and I've always tried to program um, like against my personal bias so that I'm doing work that feels important to me, but also doing work that I think has a broad, um, broad palette for, for different folks to come in and find something that's appealing to them. And then there are, um, there are a number of uh, early career young folks, um, young in their, in, their, uh, in their creative projects, not all in age, um, who I think are attracted to the um, the like myth of the great Broadway musical and wanting to capture that in their own work, but um, but don't have a, yet a sense of, of uh, structure and form, and um, 
are really just figuring out how to make their idea live in a way that it involves music and storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, learning that it's really hard to write a musical, which I think people don't, I, I, maybe because of like the tap <laughs> shoes and jazz hands, people think like, oh, this is like, I just, I have an idea and I want to make a musical out of it. And then like, well, welcome to 10 years of stuff. <laughs> you know? so, um, so, but then looking specifically at this group of folks who, who were the founding artists of the Musical Theater Factory, um, one of the first things that we did, well, first of all, our space is a black box, which opens itself up to new form. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, then the first thing that we did when we were building the organization was have a discussion about what sort of um, what sort of obstacles that early career writers are facing in the development of their work. And the, uh, the thing that was the clearest is that uh, nowadays, most writers are writing for music stand readings or 54 Below concerts. And um, because that's how they get their work out there, that's, they end up actually censoring their creative brain and outputting material that lives successfully in those formats. Um, and there's whole other um, aspects of musical theater writing and creation that get left behind. Choreography, the body in general. Oh, and they're not getting used to working with directors. Yeah, or right. on the director's territory. Absolutely. And not getting, no, that's a, yeah. yeah. So, so one of the things that we committed to doing was, was um, like our 4 by 15 program, which you know about. We, we um, nearly monthly invite four uh, writing teams to submit um, uh, a 15 minute excerpt and then we give them five hours of rehearsal space to stage it with a director and a choreographer if need be. Um, and so that before they even have their first act written at times, they're getting to see some of their work live on its feet and understand how it exists spatially and how characters and story are developed um, you know, by staging <laughs> and not just at a stand through um, really good uh, you know, words. And but um, but th then I think beyond the 4 by 15 program, uh, we're also, we have like a writer's group, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to cultivate, I think, some voices um, who both in, in structure and content are bringing something unique to the scene, in terms mm -hmm. of what's out there in your musical theater. And um, sometimes it's the quest to buck the form that creates the next great idea, sometimes it's the quest to um, to say my point of view is um, like Michael Jackson said last night I'm I am uh, like a downtown point of view with uptown aspirations um, so why shouldn't we bring this material that's usually relegated to the fringe and try and infiltrate the structure of the Great American Musical mm -hmm. and tell our stories <coughs> mm -hmm. so I think both those things are happening how much do you find music informs that uh, I guess, and I guess what I mean, and this is sort of coming back to Michael's earlier comment about uh, whether or not it's the content that's new or the form that's new, you know. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm I'm working on a, right now an Afro-Cuban musical and a bluegrass musical mm -hmm. and a rock musical, mm -hmm. and you know, on and on. So, you know, really to me, the, the a couple of those musicals are formally very different, and a couple of them are formally not different at all. It's just the fact that the music is different that's, that's changing that. Mm -hmm. Is that how much of, of the music informs what you feel the difference is versus the actual structures? That's a really good question. I like that you ended with what you feel, um, because I do think it's a, it's a feeling. It's a, it's a, you can map it out in so many ways, but there's a, a, a sense about, especially in the, in the chaos of new work, like you have to really trust your intuition a lot of mm -hmm. things. I'm thinking, I don't know where this is coming from, but I'm thinking of, um, of uh, the dance form Buto, which is like my, my discipline, my training, uh, before coming into musical theater, and um, there was a, a huge rift in the Buto movement between the two founders, um, where basically one believed that essence came before form, and one believed that form could only come from essence. And like the Buto split into two schools of thought and two practices and dis disseminated in that direction. It's Lehman Engel versus NYU. There you go. <laughs> so it works for us too. Joking. But, but, uh, I think I think they're doing things. Uh, but, but I think that's a really good question because 
Uh, you know, we have folk operas, we have rock operas, we have electronic Fantasias coming mm -hmm. through the factory. Um, and so if, if, if someone's point of entry into a story uh, comes from a place of um, wanting to make an intervention with a specific kind of sound, then I think the world that's built around that is going to be driven by, uh, by the music. But, but at the same time, if someone comes into the work of making it a musical specifically because there is a specific story they need to tell that represents um, a person or a community or a culture or a moment in time that has sonic specificity, then that story is going to then that's going to dictate how the music has to function and, and be written and be created. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. I think you did. It's sort of chicken or egg in a, a little, a little I think bit so. of way. Do you find that to be true, Michael? Your well, it's funny. I take a <clears throat> whenever I'm feeling pessimistic, I take a long view. Uh, but the history of music theater, of music theater that I love and where the music exists, and uh, sadly we do not have the Greek music, so it's, it is lost to us, we don't have to know. Uh, but is actually of this chicken egg amazingness, which is that like Mozart coming upon opera buffa and then the singspiel, and exploding both those conventions through, and yet maintaining, and, and in some ways tr transcending them while living within them, uh, a very, fighting against every stupid convention of Italian opera that he inherited, but weirdly, by the end, still loving to live within that convention, in fact, defending it to his death, even as he's basically exploded it in false death at the end of his life. Um, and then, uh, like, the Beggar's Opera, which is really a parody of Handel operas, mm -hmm. but it actually invents an entire new form, and then becomes, magically, the Three Penny Opera, when Brecht adapts it, which then explodes the whole idea of a street opera in a whole new way and sort of invents a whole new way that American musicals can steal from that and half of us, I mean, every musical you love of the last 50 years probably steals from Brecht and Vile, so including Vile himself. Uh, which is only to say that those moments when, it, it, when it's like, well, there's this form that I'm stuck with and I want to break it, but I have to live within it, or I, this form, but what if I take this and throw it into this form, mm -hmm. tend to be the two oh, all over and over, even beyond the musical, the musical as we know it, uh, into sort of the longer view of musical theater as it's existed. And I think that's where sometimes I wish that we could talk in a moment where performance art is so vibrant and explosive in New York, in uh, this, in this country, and uh, globally. Uh, at a moment when I think what we used to call classical music is more vibrant, certainly in New York, than it's been a long time, and when uh, young classical composers are much more excited, I think, about narrative and about. Uh, narrative forms of music than ever before. What makes me kind of bummed is how much there, we've let walls break down. And, and when the, the popular music scene is so is fragmented, but in a way that's amazing, that it's so easy for people to work in any of those disciplines and have no idea about the others. Uh, mm -hmm. So you get sort of comical moments when like performance art discovers narrative, or vice versa when like uh, musical theater people discover dance. Like, as if, as if it's like, I didn't know this thing was out there. Right. Thing was um, and we all do it, and it's a little embarrassing, and how we can, because that's where the forms, that's when, when people from dis different disciplines meet each other's forms, and right. discover all the forms, you know, that every discipline has its own formal rules, or its yeah. own hackneyed forms that could use fresh air. Right. There's a really interesting uh, collaboration that we're forging with the factory right now, which is with a downtown company called Poetic Theater Productions. They operate out of Wild Project, and they uh, they work with poets, spoken word artists, and hip hop artists who are interested in making theater, and playwrights who come from a poetic poetic background. Um, and I've seen a bunch of stuff there. It always involves music and storytelling, oftentimes dance. And they do not consider anything they do there musical theater. Um, and then we have a bunch of writers at the Musical Theater Factory who are really interested in you know the the avenue that's been opened up by Lin Manuel Miranda with hip hop and musical theater, and their they're trying to write rap and bring in a whole different sensibility to their work. So we're we're gonna have like a, a mixer, basically, where we bring poetic theater and musical theater factory together just to be like, what could we make using each other's, you know, points of departure. Interesting. Yeah, yeah it's, I've I've been involved in two separate productions. Uh, 
one where it was clearly a musical by anybody's definition, and the writers did not want to call it a musical because they don't come from that background. Mm. And I said, you wrote a musical. Don't be a self-loathing musical theater writer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so call it a musical. And, and another one where they were like, I don't know, I think this might be a musical. And I went, I think if you call it a musical, the audience you get will not be the audience you want to be in the room. Right? So sometimes it's an interesting dynamic of how you label things and what expectation gets created uh, by that. Brent, you, uh, as a uh, uh, director of New Works for um, the National Alliance for Musical Theater, the uh, Alliance produces this fantastic festival every year of new musicals, which basically becomes a showcase for producers around the country. Uh, and you get scads of, uh, of entries for that. Um, uh, from all over the world, really, and from all level of writer, from advanced career to early career. Uh, so you, ha I feel like you have this incredible bird's eye view of the industry and of writing in general that's going on for music musicals. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have noticed any trends over the last seven, eight years that you've been in that job. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that um, I talked to someone about this a couple of weeks ago. The uh, when I first started in two thousand eight, there were a lot of uh, musicals based on pre-existing material, but more commonly known, so mostly well-known books or movies. Uh, almost all of our movie scripts are gone now, and that's just naturally because uh, all the movie houses. Thanks to Wicked and Kinky Boots and a bunch of other shows have realized, hey, there's money in our properties. So almost every single movie house has a, uh, their own uh, theatrical division now or they're owned by a movie house that has a theatrical division. So those have basically gone away, which is great because they were a pain in the rear end to deal with <laughs> um, just from a logistics and license uh, uh, underlying rights standpoint. We had many shows we were very excited by and we could never get the movie house to release the rights fully. They want to release the rights for the next step and then make a decision. The next step, make a decision. So that's actually uh, very happy to get rid of those, not because I don't love movie musicals, um, musicals based on movies, but it's just, um, it made things uh, open up a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, people are moving a lot more towards uh, adaptations of lesser known material mm -hmm. or in the public domain. So Jane Austen, really popular right now. <laughs> uh, we're heading to a period where uh, some of Fitzgerald's work, if not most of it's entering into the public domain now. Um, so there's a lot of that or random articles people have read, short stories are easy to get your hands on. It's very common for writers to want to work around something that's or a structure that's already existing, like Michael said. It's part of your work's done for you. Otherwise, it really is very difficult. Um, but we're seeing, um, you know, we you know, we got over two hundred. We got two hundred twenty-three submissions this year for eight spots in the festival, which is in two weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, you know, the thing that we're not seeing being kind of sent around anymore are kind of the big traditional, splashy commercial musicals. Mm -hmm. and I don't think that's because they don't exist. I think it's because those are the shows that tend to get a commercial producer to snatch them up very quickly and early on in the process because it's something that almost any commercial producer can go, oh, that's just like blank meets blank meets blank had a baby and it's this musical and I know how to sell that and done. Well, it's harder for a commercial producer to want to pick up you know, Hostage Song that we did in 2009, which is very not structured like a musical and is about two people held hostage who don't have happy endings at the end. Uh, commercial producer can snatch up as easily as something with the toes right. happen. Right. Do, you, do you think that, do you, as a, somebody who also has a lot of interface with commercial producers, do you think that's changing at all with things like Fun Home? I'm thinking of Fun Home and Natasha Pierre. I think both Sam French properties. Look at that. Just plugged you guys. Um, uh, you know, I think about shows like that or uh, uh, the David Byrne show that was at the Fear Lies Love. 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 Um, not a Sam French property, so I couldn't remember the title. Um, <laughs> so, uh, do you feel like uh, uh, the success of those sort of non-traditionally structured, informed shows ch has changed producers' minds at all, or absolutely or is? There's some producers who are able to look at a property and figure out how to uh, whack their way through the weeds and create a new path for it. Mm -hmm. And there's brilliant producers who do that. 
there are a lot of producers who need someone to do that for them. And honestly, that extends to regional theaters. Oh, sure. That Absolutely. extends to most people in the field. A lot of them need <laughs> someone to whack their way to be like, oh, I will follow the Memphis path and I will do the Memphis thing with it. Right. Um, but there are shows, you know, I love our show Come From Away. When the first time I read it, I was like, this is amazing. If someone were to say to me that commercial Tony Award winning commercial producers would pick it up within a month of the festival and it will have a two, soon to be four theater pre development track, it opens up in November at Seattle Rep, I would be like, seriously? This is a commercial show? And now I'm like, of course it is. Yeah. Because some of the people who picked it up, Junkyard Dog Productions, producers in Memphis, are smart and they knew how to take that show and do something different with it. Right. So it just kind of depends. There's shows of ours that I'm always, you know, The Sandman, which is a very unique German style, uh, scary sort of opera. Oh, Richard and Robert are probably watching this, going to kill me for not being it right. Uh, but it's a very different style. That has commercial producers. So I find that they're also picking up the slightly odder properties because there's something about being unique and doing something new with a new property than picking up something that's, you know, you can go, oh, that will go to this well known regional and this well known regional, and I know it will sell to this main Broadway audience. I think for a lot of them, there's a sense of success to take a fun home or right. to take a hammer right. to make something out of that. Well, it's okay. funny, those three shows you mentioned, though, uh, I think you said Fun Home, uh, Natasha and Pierre, yeah, and yeah, Caroline's Love, Caroline's yeah. Love, all three required specifically, more actually, uh, specifically of very successful recent shows, required specifically creative producing at almost every stage. Yeah. I mean, Caroline's Love went to, uh, I remember went up to Williamstown, but actually performed at Mass Mocha in a very interesting collaboration between a museum and a theater company. Um, and then it was obviously in a crazed, amazing production, but that was completely environmental mm -hmm. and required, uh, and then when it became a commercial production, required them to really think that through. Mm -hmm. uh, a fun home uh, transformed from confusingly a proscenium show when it was downtown to a show in the round when it moved uptown, which is not historically what you think of happening. Yeah. Move uptown, but really required everyone to reconceive the production from the ground up and the producers to support that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Natasha Pierre obviously is well known for the complication of its production and how much that informed the show. And and so doing it in I think end, so. anyone who makes musicals knows that um, in a funny way, whether it is at a uh, and we're all very lucky when it happens, but whether it's not for profit or for profit or actually a festival situation, um, that it is the creativity of the producers as much as, as of the writers mm -hmm. and obviously the directors, mm -hmm. who often are the handmaidens of that creativity between writers and producers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also, it's interesting too. I, I often wonder if, um, and this is something that I feel like I learned in watching Spring Awakening from well before it was even supposed to happen at the roundabout initially. And then uh, September 11th happened, and they said we cannot do this show. Uh, maybe rightfully so, but um, but watching it go from a developmental piece and everybody sort of scratching their head and going, there is no way this will ever be a commercial project, to and ending up in the hands of Tom Holson and Ira Pittleman, who were like, it's absolutely a commercial project, and then worked for seven years trying to make it a commercial project. And then it became a commercial project, and then nobody knew it was a commercial project until suddenly it was one. Mm -hmm. And when it was a commercial success, then of course it was a commercial success. We all knew it all the time. Yeah. Uh, you know that, that we don't know what's commercial until it's commercial or commercialized in a way. And well, that, that's that, it. Tom and Ira didn't make it commercial. No, they figured right. out how to sell it to theaters and to investors and to audiences. And I doubt they ever you know took aside the writers and said, "Oh, we're going to change this, and here are tax shoes." Right. You know, they figured out a way to to find their own path to develop the show, which is very brave, while other producers would possibly, or theaters would have possibly said, right. you know, well, we can't have intermission, people won't come back. So now let's squish it down to 90 minutes and Although I think four about, less actors. Yeah, I think about Bloody Bloody, for example, and the sort of, uh, or actually, let's go back to Fortress, because that's the one where you specifically said, we're going to break the rules, you know. <laughs> and But then how much did, say, Daniel have uh, a say in, that. I mean, I think about Spring Awakening with Michael, Michael Mayer, who directed the original production, had a huge influence on the final shape of that. I have never worked, this is my dirty little secret, I've never worked on a show ever, 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 ever where a director was not involved from the first day. So I don't actually know, I just don't know how that works. Because, <laughs> back to my opening point, which was, uh, at some point you will have darkness. 
all in one time. <laughs> what you will definitely want to do is hire your director because it must be their fault. <laughs> uh, and what's really nice is when said director is so a part of it, partly because at some point your director will direct it badly and you'll have a second preview and be like, oh my gosh, all of Act One is misstaged. That does not mean they are not a great director. It means they tried something, and what, most of the directors are the ones who actually are like, we're restaging all of Act One tomorrow. And I've yeah. seen that happen, <laughs> and it's an amazing thing to watch. Yeah. And actually, it's sort of depressing, because you watch and go like, oh, you've solved all my storytelling. It's not like, I, I have no power here. This is <laughs> in your hand. You're the genius here. Uh, but that, to me, is that it's nice to know that the director is part of the storytelling from day one, and is thinking about how the storytelling will be on stage as you write. So it's asking questions about how do I stage the scene as part of the process as opposed to looking at your finished script and asking you that question at which point you say, I, we can't work together or something. <laughs> I don't have it, but that's just how I work. Jackson, as, as a director, how, how when you're negotiating that process, how aware are you of, it's me, it's the writer, does that get confusing? Uh, how do you very, negotiate those conversations? It gets very confusing, yeah. but in a great way. You know, it's like what Michael's saying. Um, I mean, I just did that on, on these paper bullets in, in LA. Saw the an entire chunk of it. I mean, a lot of it, and it was horrible. And and the next day, we came in and redid the entire thing. And uh, immediately, things started working. You know, but uh, the writer in that case, uh, Roland Jones, he he helped me. You know, do that. And then I also, you know get in his business, you know what I mean? Just because at, at a certain point, um, it's a brand new thing. And so if you trust the people that you're working with, um, you're trying to figure it out together, honestly. I mean, no, everybody wants exactly the same thing, you know, in, in a good collaboration, so. Um, I know that yeah. musicals can be made in groups of people, among groups of people who hate each other and then never speak again, but I don't, <laughs> I actually, I believe that's from a day when musicals took less time to develop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. You well, can't work yeah. for five years with people that you despise. Right. You yeah. cannot. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe for enough money. But but there's, not <laughs> long, there's actually not enough money in the world. For that. Well, I think there, there, well, there are also legendary stories of writing teams yeah. who yeah. continued to write together, and that's who just did not generally like each other that much. Well, it's like Michael saying, like watching somebody that he's working with do some not great work on something and not have it be personal at all. Just be like, oh, they, they did that. Tomorrow they're going to, you know, there's a trust thing um, that goes both ways, too. So that, you know, you're, you're, you're right. tru you trust, right. you know. Uh, I think we're at a point where we should open it up to questions. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, go to a little bit about development because you talk about new forms. How can you not talk about how those new forms are created? Yeah, I have a question for Jackson. Um, with these favorite bullets, I haven't seen it, so uh, if it's, this is an obvious question. Was it this Billy Joe Armstrong? Uh, and with American Idiot, that was music from the album American Idiot. This is new songs, correct? That yes. Is, do you feel like that has been different than you would imagine a traditional musical theater conversation to be as you're developing those new songs? How is the process working? Does he just send you songs in a vacuum? Like, what is the relationship there? Um, it is a, It's what I imagined it would be because it calls the it calls for a specific thing. Um, it, it's it's inspired by uh, the Beatles, and so um, I there's a certain sound that he's you know really captured very well. Um, he does just send things, you know, um, but he's also been with us, you know, um, and actually it's been, uh, it's been a great experience in the sense that I didn't, um, he maybe would hate me saying this, but I didn't expect him to love theater as much as he does, you know what I mean? So he's very, he, he really gets into it, you know, he has, it's a certain joy joyful uh, thing for him um, and a great thing watching him try to uh, help us figure out what we need for just good old storytelling you know something that just just pushes it the action forward you know I mean that's the thing it's that that's that's what he talks about just like we would all talk 
You know, it, I think that's probably why he's good at what he does because he also goes back to the basic uh, things and doesn't actually worry about am I trying to do something new or not. You know, he he's back with us. You know, so. Are the songs primarily diegetic in that, in meaning that they're they are performances because. It's a story of a band, essentially, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. For the most part, uh, they are the band performing. Mm -hmm. uh, but then um, there are a few songs. Uh, the, the last songs in the piece are character action driven. Mm. Uh, so it, it kind of, um, well, it breaks out of the, perf the performance into hero slash Higgy on our show. Please come out of the bathroom. I'm so sorry. I called you a whore. which no joke my mother brought me to because my sister got the flu and decided why not bring this one <laughs> uh, and that was a horrible idea because look at me now <laughs> I think um, I didn't grow up um, watching or seeing musicals or theater really for that for, for that matter um, but I think I was the Wizard of Oz I'm pretty sure like a musical version of, of um, yeah <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Jackson, one of the things you talked about earlier was talking about how the work that we do now is inherent to the form itself, to the theater, and what makes the theater different than other forms of expression in our world today. And we have the world in our pocket. We can get on our Netflix queue, we can see Hulu Plus, we can watch a YouTube video, we can see a Periscope, a live stream. So as you're all exploring what it means to embark on a new form in the theater, how are you finding people are embracing the definition of, of what a theater experience is versus an experience that has a hybrid or that is meant to be delivered through another medium? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can speak to that. Okay. Yeah. 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 Just, yeah. By virtue of the Thank fact you. that our theater is like a 60 seat black box, um, one of the things that's really huge for the artists working at the factory is is the issue of intimacy. Uh, and um, and actually one of the new forms that I think is really uh, coming out of this, like the, the natural progression from the music stand reading and concert series is this new 
um, immersive song cycle phenomenon that is mm. uh, like we did Boys Who Tricked Me um, and Zoe, that was by Ben Bonham and then like uh, Zoe Sarnak's The Years Between mm -hmm. uh, and um, there's this idea to like actually do theater that involves eye contact like being this close with people and saying we're, I'm telling a story and I'm playing a character but I'm also a person that's right here with you and I think that is a direct response, a theatrical response to the distance that we feel culturally with all of our social media and other forms of entertainment. Yeah, Kate Kerrigan and Brian Lauterbach yeah, are that's... also turning uh, Tales from a Bad Year, which they wrote just as a song cycle. Into a massive, into a immersive, massive immersive house thing. party. Yeah, house, it's a house party. party. Yeah. It's huge. There's yeah. rooms and you go, it's like Sleep No More, mm -hmm. but not but with, songs. with songs. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to say that part of that. I'm starting to have a conversation with people where they talk about Sleep No More as a reference and Natasha Pierre as a reference. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing for a lot of writers to have a brave, to be brave enough to do something that's different. They need someone, they need to be able to compare it to something or go, oh, well, it worked because Natasha Pierre did this or Fun Home was able to do it in the round. Um, but I think one of the bigger challenges going down the line is that the vast majority of theaters in this country are for seniors. Mm -hmm. So future life, it's like, great, Natasha Pierre right now lives in a tent, it's awesome in a tent, but the future of life is really going to be judged when people start putting out a proscenium. And can yeah, they have a Sure, certainly once it starts getting licensed, it's interesting though to me because what I, what I sort of notice as an underpinning of all of this is that um, the necessity of an off-Broadway scene, right? Because there is no off-Broadway musical theater scene anymore. We've been moaning about it for years, that it's simply too expensive. It doesn't make economic sense anymore. So shows that should never go to Broadway suddenly have nowhere to go. Maybe some regional theaters can do them, and, but then how do they have a continued life? And I think this is one of the things that writers are responding to, is they're suddenly going, oh, but if we don't do it in a traditional space, and we call it something else, then we suddenly have created a musical theatrical experience mm -hmm. that can exist somewhere that doesn't need all the bells and whistles that a proscenium stage dictates. Mm -hmm. Which I think is really a, a large part of what Natasha Pierre created was a sense of, oh, you can do that. Yeah. And so then suddenly you can start to think about creating shows for alternative spaces, which I think is also, actually important. I mean, there's another model that is, it's a, uh, it, which is, I mean, it's, a, it's one person's name, uh, is Jason Robert Brown, which is right. to say the two most produced musicals in America uh -huh. are uh, shows, yeah, and, uh, are Last Five Years and Songs for the World, right. which is to say shows that uh, have had New York productions and uh -huh. good, good ones, uh, but where their lives were weirdly not necessarily based on those. They did not go to Broadway. Let's put it simply. They did not go to Broadway, and therefore their lives actually now are entirely based on their lives now. That right. they, are, they are now self-generating in a way that's very interesting to look at. Right. And it's the question of, um, I think that's where there is a question of glory which is that you want to win awards, you want to be on the Broadway, you want to many things that you would like to happen. And then there's a question of, I always, I mean, weirdly in the age of social media, you go to college campuses or high schools and theater is so alive. I, I mean, I grew up in America and theater, there was not this much theater being done. The, the, so the, the there is so area, much yeah. live theater with live humans, with live people watching those live humans. It's more than ever, ever, ever before on campuses and at high schools and things like that. So the question of, I mean, the problem is there's a question of like the Lord theater scene. There's the question of the New York theater scene. There's the question of Broadway and the off-Broadway scene. Right. And all those are important, but there's an entire other yeah level of culture off of which you can actually make quite a lot of money if we're actually worried about whether the creators are going to make money. But that is not thought of, which is called everything else. Right. It's all those, I mean, as Sam French knows, but that's the nice thing about that, which is called licensing. Right. Um, and the interesting thing is that question of how to, uh, how to maybe make works that aren't going to make you win you a Tony Award or a Pulitzer or run on Broadway but that are going to be, I mean, 
songs from Songs for New World are in the culture more than almost any show currently playing on Broadway, if you just mean that an entire generation has grown up knowing those songs and singing. Right. And last five years I mean, as well. Anyone who goes to auditions knows that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, young men and women audition with those songs, and so they love those songs, and those songs are in some ways more meaningful, yeah. and those shows are, than a lot of the things that we're making in New York for a very specific Scene. And there is a translation to proscenium stage ability for some of those. Like I've seen, you know, last five years done on college campuses in very strange places, and and also, you know, on a traditional off Broadway yeah. stage at Second Stage. Uh, so you know, the, there's a mutability to those forms that allow it to exist. And and I I think because of the absence of an off Broadway scene where writers can make a living and can sort of have that spotlight shown on them that they're not appropriate Broadway shows because they're too small, too intimate, too weird. Hedwig is another perfect example of that, which finally made it to Broadway, but didn't depend, its existence didn't depend on that. Uh, you know, the, thinking outside the box of what venue is and what the experience of the audience is becomes important to understanding that. Mm -hmm. Just for context, um, Natasha Pierre, which was done environmentally in a tent, uh, is now having a, another life at ART in a proscenium, mm -hmm. and will come back to Broadway uh, a year from now in a proscenium. And I imagine Fun Home, which started in a proscenium and now is in the round, when it does get licensed or when it goes out on tour, okay. will probably go back to the proscenium. Yeah. 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 And actually, yeah. it's probably great for them that they've experienced yeah. it in the proscenium, so they have some. No, I think having, I mean, that's the exciting thing about shows that can exist in different, I mean, that don't have to be. It turns out Oklahoma is great, as we've heard this summer, in an environmental way. Yeah, and also, yeah. we all know Oklahoma is quite great. Do you get right. to eat the corn? Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. So it, it occurred to me that we've had now two conversations here about new forms and haven't talked about technology at all, which seems strange for a conversation about innovation. Well, we're all Luddites in the theater. So. Well, we're just, we are we're not. Like, I, yeah, right. So I'm not thinking think the way that like promises, promises didn't exist until the mixing board existed. Yes. And like, you can't do a Miz in a world without microphones. And I'm wondering, like, you know, what are the technologies that are enabling us to create new forms today that aren't the like, oh, we're going to do projections and have tweets on this screen, but like things yeah. that are actually like, you know, I mean, maybe, yes, maybe that, but like, <laughs> but, but but things that are like maybe a little more native to the theatrical experience. That I, I know of one one writer in particular who's made this a bit of a mission, which is Duncan Sheik, mm -hmm. actually, because Duncan comes from a music background mm -hmm. and a touring background, not a musical theater background necessarily, although he's embraced that wholeheartedly. Uh, but the thing that always and continues to drive him crazy is the sound in theaters is generally very bad. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're approaching it from a concert aesthetic, yeah. right? So he has chosen to start creating scores using um, Ableton Live and electronic looping materials because that allows, it's an instrument, you know? And it, it really is a yeah. skill and you an instrumental skill to be able to create those. Uh, and so using people running those the, the new sound technology that exists allows him a lot more control over how it's going to finally sound when it's in the theater. American Psycho is an example of that, so you'll be seeing it very shortly. Um, but, uh, but most of the scores, uh, there's a piece in uh, the National Alliance for Musical Theater Festival this year called Noir, which also he does that uh, in. And it's a very conscious effort of mixing live instrumentation with these electronic uh, instruments, for lack of a better word, right now, because I don't think we have a word for them, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, it, and it, it helps him control the sound and create the sounds he wants to have the audience hear uh, within the context of the music. So that's one way, for sure. And, and there's also Val Vagoda from Groovy Lily, right. who was uh, Sydney Beauty Wakes and Strike 12, has a one-woman show, two, one, one one-woman show, one-woman one, show, one, two-person. One-woman one <laughs> show, two people in it. Um, that are both her looping, singing, and playing all instruments herself. Right. Um, which is something she's really started exploring, which is amazing and inspiring. And you kind of, part of the show is watching her 
do it all herself. And, and it's really just her. And it's either currently playing in Boston or just finished in Boston. Just Edison, finished in Boston. At Arts Emerson. So yeah. Ernest Jekyll Charles, man. Grace McLean is a great artist doing a lot of the True, work. that's true as well. Um, at the factory, this is maybe not it, it, more in terms of development rather than production, but we're really excited about a new program. that We've, we've just um, been gifted 15 tablets. Um, which has allowed us to have completely paperless development processes, which if you've ever worked on a new musical, mm -hmm. you know you spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars and a lot of trees um, to going through drafts and new pages. And um, so we were piloting this through, um, there was a musical that we were developing called Junk that was a, in a lot of ways about consumer excess, and we started trying to do this paperless development process. And after doing two um, full 20-hour reading processes where not a page was printed, um, we wrote a proposal and got funding to get 15 tablets. So we're working with our writers. Um, it's tricky, and they're not like glamorous tablets, so they, they're not like, we don't have all have you know iPads. So, um, but, um, but it's really incredible the kind of things you can do in terms of um, notating on a score if you're an actor and you wanted to make notes on your music, or if there's changes made, um, just having a PDF like instantly reinserted. And also the freedom it opens up you can't do this if you're doing an equity reading because there's no staging allowed and you have to have books in hand. But when you just are doing a workshop and you don't have enough time to get off book, but you can just hold a little tablet that like scrolls rather than a clumsy binder, it opens up a lot of room for exploration. Can I redefine technology or at least uh, just, sure, just say sure, one sure. thing that happens in the theater that is, uh, I'll call progressive, even though it's really old progressive, okay. which is just called, I, especially when you work on Broadway, but in any new theater, I get to work with three, maybe four proud unions that are actually, for all I complain about them and for all the problems they may have <laughs> and their members may complain about, are succeeding and doing their jobs really well and keeping people employed, which in this country is so unbelievable uh, and not to be sniffed at. I, I actually, uh, I get very concerned when writers and directors are among the worst at wishing that everything would just be easier and faster, which generally means that people would work more for less. Uh, and I think the fact is, theater is incredibly good at, uh, one of the great things in New York is that the theater, the theater industry is unbelievably good at employing humans for salaries that aren't appalling. And that is a really, it's a thing that we forget. It makes art, but also, um, how Prince has one of the most beautiful things when asked what he's proudest of in his whole life, is that the Phantom of the Opera has employed blank people for blank years, and he had he had the number in his head because it really doesn't matter. Then in the end, the thing he's proudest of is that he directed and produced a show that has been responsible for the kind of employment, at the, the levels of employment that you'd think of of like a large company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is, and all union members who all in that, within that theater get along and have worked together for years and years and years. And then that, as we speak of technology, I think as we speak of progress, the danger is that we forget that part of it, which is the human beings make this. Yeah, and I mean, then when you make a musical especially, it's not just, the, you may write it and you may produce it and you may direct it, but there are, even on the smallest musicals, a hundred people who are keeping that thing going. Yeah, I think that you know, when I was talking about Duncan, one of the important things to understand about the way he's using this technology is he's using it as an instrument. Yes. Right? And so it's not meant to replace anybody. It's actually meant to be a musician. Yes. No, and I think right. Duncan has been, I think that's what's exciting is as how the technology and the unions can learn to accept each other and understand each other's right. issues and move forward that way rather than thinking of technology as always being disruptive. I think we like to think of it that way, which generally means job cutting. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. I'm sorry we have to end here. We, we want to keep the conversation going. Um, thank you so much to our panelists and our moderators. This is amazing. Thank you.